Our scripture today is taken from the book of Luke, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 13. Listen, people of God, for this is God's word to us. Some of the crowds said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself that is not rich for its God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was in the ocean by the sea. But he didn't do those things. 
He did what he often does. He offered a parable. The parable of the rich fool. A rich classic. The rich fool, a wealthy farmer, has a bumper crop. It exceeds his storage capacity. So he decides the right thing to do is to tear down those old barns and big, build bigger ones to store away his blessings. Then he can eat, drink, and be merry. Did you notice the I as we were reading through that scripture? The personal pronoun. Six times at least, depending on how you read the translation, you hear the word I in the story, or the possessive pronoun my in the story. Listen. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And I'll say to myself, you have ample goods. You see, most of this parable's dramatic action doesn't actually occur in the real world, but in the guy's head. His imagination. The rich fool is talking to himself. He's his own consultant. In Jesus' parables, though, lots of times one of the problems for us is trying to figure out where we fit in the story, right? Who are we? So consider this story of a middle-aged man, not me, who was remembering a childhood book of parables that his parents had read to him every night as a child. He particularly remembered this text because it frightened him every single time. The man being demanded of his life this very night. And after they read the parable, he would pray, No, my lady is not asleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die before I wake. Yes. And there he was with his parents' home, and as an adult, middle aged man, he pulls the book off the shelf, he's looking through the pages. He finds the parable and he notices something he'd never seen before. The rich fool in the children's book was pictured as a middle-aged guy with thinning hair and a little bit of tummy growing. And he realized that it was a splitting image of himself. Now we may think of a rich fool as an ultra rich. If we went to the Census Bureau and talked about average Americans when compared to the rest of the world, we find ourselves in a parable. And the tension of the story is that really no one here in this sanctuary likes to think that that parable applies to them. And in fact, compared to all of the rest of God's creation and all of God's children, it applies to every single one of us. We underestimate compared with the rest of the world. They did a survey with a, a group of average Americans, whatever that is, saying, how much do you think the average income for people around the world is? And so what did they say? They said they thought the average individual income was about $20,000 a year. In actual fact, it's a tenth of that, $2,100. Similarly, those Americans thought that they were probably maybe about the top 40% of the wealth distribution. Again, turns out more like the top 10%. But it's not just about money. Did you know that we Americans have 10 times more of the storage space than somebody who lives even in the United Kingdom? Consider this story of another pastor who was reviewing the sermon files preparing for this Sunday this text today. And he found an old sermon that he had written 10 years before 
when he preached on the text, and it mentioned that a bicycle that he had hanging on the hooks in the garage that had been there since the year they had moved in, the year 2000. So now we're talking over 20 years span. The sermon mentioned, that 10 year old sermon, that the bike had moved, that they still had it, just in case. 10 years later, had it moved. Actually, the tires had brought it. And so five years before, he'd had new tires put on it, taken a spin down the driveway, and put it back up. That was the only movement it had had. Just two weeks before this Sunday that he was to preach on this text, his wife suggested, hey, maybe, maybe we should give that bike away to, to one of those organizations that would help somebody else. And he grimaced, hesitated said, let me think about it. So imagine his dismay when he pulled open the file, when he read the text, and he found that 10-year-old sermon and what he said about the bike. What, what am I thinking, he said? What am I thinking, that one day this is going to be worth $10,000 on the antique road show? The bike went to the giveaway because where he lived, people actually could We get the guy there. Who among us doesn't wish that we would have the assurance at some point in life that we would have enough to relax, to eat, drink, to be merry? In the parable, it doesn't seem like Jesus is saying that the rich guy did anything specific wrong. He's not wicked or unjust. He's not mistreated anybody or committed a crime. He's careful. He's conservative. And yet the parable is clearly critical of the wealthy man. In the parable, the rich man is called a fool. A fool because he's a parent. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's a familiar proverbial expression of hedonism. An ancient school of thought. The, life of, the way of life is on the doctrine of pleasure or happiness. And that's the sole chief good in life. But as Jesus continues in the story, God says to the man, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. The language there in the Greek is the language that is for the calling in of the loan. Something entrusted to God by God for a time is demanded back. Something is due. God calls this man a fool who thinks that by securing material goods that he needs, that he now has a secure life, failing to recognize that the life he has comes from God. The man is focused on the material, and that's what matters to him most. Right there in the text, in that little line, is the reminder that everything you and I are, everything that we have, is a gift from God. The culture tells us that none of it's a loan, none of it's a gift, but rather it's all mine. I earned it, right? You and I have to continually remind ourselves of everything, including this very self, this shell I'm in, is on loan from a generous, gracious God. But it's a loan. The real heir of the rich fool rights fame preacher Barbara Brown Taylor is not that his vision was too big when he decided to build those bigger barns. It's that his vision was not big enough to include all of the kingdom of God, all of what God wanted to do with him. Think about that. He had all of the extra bounty, what he could have done for his neighbors, what he could have done for other people around him who were desperately in need. But no, that's not what he chose to do. In fact, what happened was that he allowed his wealth to shrink his vision, to narrow his vision, to give him tunnel vision. All he can see is himself and his own needs. Does our wealth expand our vision of the world and God's kingdom? Or is it cause you and me to shrink back as we guard, protect, and take care of? Is money in the stuff that I've accumulated isolating me from my neighbors, 
Be thankful. 